Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for your patience. Um, and thank you for attending tonight. Uh, this event is being jointly sponsored by the Center for Public Leadership and the Taubman Center for State and Local Government at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. In fact, in attendance tonight, we have uh, Harvard Kennedy School student members of the Taubman Center um, that were part of the Utah transition term team that aided Governor Cox's transition during the January term. We welcome them and thank them for their service. Uh, my name is James Moore. I'm a fellow Utahn and an MBA student at the Harvard Kennedy School. And it's my privilege to introduce tonight's moderator who will outline this evening's agenda and introduce our distinguished guest. As our moderator, some of you may know Roger Porter as the IBM Professor of Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School and as having held senior economic policy positions for several years, 11 years in the West Wing of the White House for Presidents Ford, Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. What you may not know, though, is that Pres Professor Porter grew up in Provo, Utah, and his first summer job in government was working for the Utah State Legislature and later for a bipartisan citizen organization called Utahns for Effective Government. After graduating from Brigham Young University, he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and earned his PhD from Harvard, and then he joined the Kennedy School faculty, and he's been there ever since, except for the three periods of public service in Washington. Suffice it to say, he has roots in Utah, and he's looking forward to tonight's discussion with our special guest, as I know all of you are too. So without further ado, Professor Porter. Well, thank you very much, James, and thanks for all of your efforts in pulling uh, this forum together. We're extremely fortunate to have with us tonight one of the nation's newest uh, governors elected last November with you know, both enthusiasm and uh, wide bipartisan support. And this gives us an opportunity to talk about the substance of the challenges that we are facing as a country in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and restoring economic prosperity from the perspective of someone who's literally on the front lines in this battle. It also gives us the opportunity to discuss the way in which we go about addressing the challenges that we are facing as, as a country from the approach and culture that we establish in making important decisions and in trying to bring the country together. It's hard to think of a period in our lifetimes when the challenges have been greater. One of the qualities that voters use in assessing candidates is their experience and their background. Have they demonstrated the ability to lead? Are they familiar with the terrain over which they will guide us in the journey? And Spencer Cox, the newly elected governor of the state of Utah, is intimately familiar with government at the state and local level. His public service began as the mayor of a small town, continued as a county commissioner for one of the 29 counties in the state of Utah. He was a member of the Utah State House of Representatives and then has been lieutenant governor for the last eight years. When his predecessor, a very popular governor, Gary Herbert, decided not to run for a third term, Spencer Cox faced John Huntsman, a former governor who had resigned to accept the post of U.S. ambassador to China and later had served as U.S. ambassador to Russia. And they had a very close primary contest, which Spencer Cox won. Uh, and then went on to win very comfortably in the general election. He earned his uh, bachelor's degree from Utah State University. He earned his uh, Juris Doctor degree uh, from Washington and Lee University, having turned down a place at the Harvard Law School. Uh, he then clerked for a federal court judge. He practiced law. He returned home to help with the family business before he began running for public office. And he's done all of this in the first 45 years of his life. He's actually coming into the position of governor of Utah at roughly the same time that John Kennedy came into the position as president of the United States. We're very grateful to him for making time in his busy schedule during this first month in office to share some thoughts with us this evening. Uh, as James has pointed out, we want to make the best use of this time, so we're going to invite him to make a few brief opening remarks. He and I will then have a discussion for a period of time, 
and then we'll open it up for your questions. Governor Cox, welcome to the Kennedy School. Thank you so much, Professor Porter. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's an honor to, to be with you. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to share some thoughts with you virtually, uh, but I need to start with a, a deep apology. Uh, sometimes those time zones lead to scheduling snafus and uh, we, we had you scheduled a couple hours from now. And so I, I, I deeply apologize for, uh, for using your precious time in, in waiting. And thank you for being so, uh, so patient with me. Uh, I, a, a few years ago, when, when I found out that Governor Herbert had, had decided not to run for office, it, it, was, it was about a year and a half ago, actually, um, we had a very important decision to make, uh, my family and I. Um, he had encouraged me to run. Uh, he, he felt like I would be the, the best person to, uh, to, to replace him. But it was not an easy decision for us. Um, I had actually, I, I guess I need to tell you how I became Lieutenant Governor. Um, I, I was working, as was mentioned, I'd been an attorney. Um, I was running the family business, which was a telecommunications business. We were having enormous success. Um, on the side, uh, I had just been elected to the House of Representatives, which is he, here in, in the state of Utah as a part-time um, assignment. Everyone has real jobs. We, uh, we meet 45 days out of the year, one of the shorter sessions. Uh, it, legislative sessions in, in the country. And uh, life was really good. I was living my dream. We had just, uh, we'd, we just bought our dream home um, on the family farm uh, where, where I was raising my kids and uh, everything was going well. When one day out of nowhere, Governor Herbert called and asked me to be his lieutenant governor. It was not an election. His lieutenant governor had resigned and uh, he needed someone to replace him. It was a shock to me. I was a freshman in the, from the middle of nowhere. No one knew who I was and uh, I certainly didn't feel qualified. I won't go through everything that went through my mind and, and the, the decision to accept that, but it was a huge cut in pay. Um, it meant uh, I, we were not moving. So I, for the last eight years, I've com been uh, commuting 200 miles round trip every day. It was 100 miles from my front door to the, uh, to the state capitol and back. It was important to continue raising our kids in, in the small town uh, where, where uh, my wife and I grew up. And, uh, and, and I, I just never seen myself as, as a politician. I, I loved the, the public service piece as, as kind of a hobby on the side um, with, with my real job. I never, never really wanted something like this. And, and the reason I never wanted something like this is, is because politics was becoming so toxic. Um, I'd spoken about it again. Now think back, this was eight years ago when I was lamenting um, how toxic our, um, our, our politics had become. In fact, six and a half years ago, I wrote an article um, about, uh, about how terrible things were, how divided we were, how politics had become a religion um, for, for many people in our country. And anyone who disagreed with your religious beliefs was a heretic and uh, was evil and uh, felt that, that we, could, we could do so much better. I thought we were nearing the bottom of that uh, six years ago, uh, and it turns out there was a whole new bottom, a basement that we didn't even know existed. Um, over, and we've seen that certainly over the, the past four years. Fast forward now, and I'll finish up here, and then, and then I look forward to, to, to taking questions and having a conversation. But Governor Herbert approached me and asked me to consider running. And as my wife and I sat down, we, we decided, first of all, that we didn't need this. We had a much better life outside of, of, of this. And, and I think that's one problem that we have in our country today is that we have too many people who def have defined themselves by their political office. They can't imagine a life outside of this. And when that's the case, um, then you have to do anything possible to get elected. The end will always be justify those, those means. Um, and so I think we have a problem with elected officials in this country. But it, it was important to us to know that we didn't need this, that we were perfectly happy not doing this. And, and quite frankly, we probably would have preferred not to do this. But we, we decided that if we were going to do it, we were going to do it differently. Um, and, and that was important to us too. We wanted not just to run to win, we wanted to run to prove that you could run for office in this country without tearing people down, without running negative ads, and, and not, not even not doing the bad stuff, but, but doing a whole bunch of good stuff. We, we made this decision to visit all 248 cities and towns in Utah. 
um, which seemed like a good idea on paper. And after about 120, we realized, wow, this was a really bad idea, but it turned out, okay, we made it to all 248. It was an incredible experience. But, but more than that, that we would do good along the way, um, that we would do service projects, that we would invite people to give back to their communities, that even if we lost, we would be able to look back and say that the world was a better, the state of Utah was a better place because of what we did. And that, that politics could actually be a force for good. Um, we were criticized for that. We were told it was, uh, you know, Pollyanna-ish, that it would, it would never work. And, uh, and of course, COVID hit and, and the whole world turned upside down. Um, we were ultimately able to, to succeed. And uh, we're hopeful uh, that the political industrial complex, as cowardly as it is, um, might actually, uh, we, we might actually inspire a few people to try it our way instead of the other way, because winning and success be, begets success. And we're hoping that there will be some copycats out there that will we'll try it a different way. So, so with that, um, I, I know there's a, a lot to talk about, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to take any more time. I'd rather talk about the things that are on your mind. So, Professor Porter, I'll, uh, I'll kick it back to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for sharing those insights into how you uh, went about making the decision to uh, run for governor. Um, in the primary, you faced an opponent who was older, who was very experienced, uh, well-respected. Uh, he could outspend you, had a lot, of, a lot of financial resources. So what do you think was the key to your success in uh, winning that very close primary election? Well, that's, that's probably a, a better question for some of the, uh, the, the political scientists here in the state, or, or, or maybe a question I should be asking you, Professor Porter, is how on earth did we, uh, did we win this and, and pull this off? It was a very close race. I, I will add that we were not just running against um, a former governor of the state, someone who had actually had the job, somebody who had run for president, um, the, the son of a billionaire and the largest philanthropic um, family in the state of Utah, uh, someone with 99% uh, name recognition, and someone who, when he left being governor, um, had the highest approval rating of any governor in the state. So we were not just running against him. Um, Utah changed their, their election process a few years ago to, to, made it pop, to, to add a signature path to the ballot, there, there were four Republicans on that primary ballot. Also included was uh, the former Speaker of the House, um, who was very, very well known, um, a, a little more conservative, uh, much more of kind of the, the, the MAGA vote um, crowd. And then we, we had a, the former um, chair of the, the, the GOP in Utah, a state party chair, who was also very wealthy, very uh, well known. Um, and, and so it, it, was a, it was a murderer's row. It was, it was really a, a tough competition. But um, to, to try to answer your question, I think there were a couple things that, um, that, that certainly helped. Um, one is that I, although I didn't have the power of incumbency being the lieutenant governor, um, I, I had probably the next best thing, um, and that is a, a popular governor who, who also supported me. Now, interesting to know, my governor uh, who endorsed me was the lieutenant governor to, um, to John Huntsman. Yeah. So he became governor because John Huntsman accepted the ambassadorship to China. He got a call one day saying, hey, I'm leaving. Congratulations, you're the new governor of the state. And so he, he owed much of his, um, you know, his, his political fortune to the guy who has now come back to run against, against me, which was a little bit of a surprise. Um, the other thing, though, I, I think that was very important was harnessing the power of social media um, and running a different type of campaign. Um, our campaign stood out because it was so different, because it was fresh. We, that's, we, we kept hearing this over and over again. We had a, a, a grassroots support, unlike anything we had seen in Utah, especially on, on the Republican side. We're a very red state, but as you know, Republicans don't donate to campaigns um, at the small dollar 
um, level like like Democrats tend to, and yet we had um, we had more small dollar donations than uh, than than all my opponents combined, and 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 any governor in the in the history of uh, of our state. Um, we were really able to harness this movement of people who were tired of politics as usual, who were looking for something good and something positive. Um, we used you know I, I I'm very active on Twitter and uh, and, and social media. Um, and, and, and you harness that to get a, a younger generation and people who had not been involved in politics actively engaged and involved. And that 248 tour of cities and towns really allowed us to connect with people. And I think that's what made the difference. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's what got you through the primary. But during the course of the general election, you did something that, uh, along with your opponent, that drew national attention. I remember watching it on the Today Show. You came up with an ad with the two of you uh, during the course of the, of the general election campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about the ad and how the idea came about and how you convinced your opponent to participate with you? Sure. Um, so th this was actually kind of something that we wanted, um, uh, or, or even, even in the primary, our, our plan had been to do these service projects and to, to invite our opponents and their supporters to, to have dueling service projects. Um, where we would show up and try to outwork each other and, and again, try to, to do good. The pandemic kind of shut that down, uh, unfortunately. Um, but as, as we were moving towards the general election, we became very concerned. Um, it turns out that we were right um, for, you know, for, for the, the, the wrong reasons, unfortunately. But um, I, I remember it was about, um, it, it, was, it was maybe a, a little over a month before the, uh, be, before the actual election. So um, it was late September, I guess. Um, and I was, I was at an event and a friend of mine came up to me and said, I'm really worried about our nation. Uh, I'm really worried about where we're heading. She said, she said, look, I, I'm worried that if, uh, if, if, um, if Joe Biden wins the election, then, uh, the Trump supporters are, are going to shoot it up. And uh, if, if, if President Trump wins the election, then President Biden's supporters are gonna burn it down. And that we could have real, we, you know, we had seen um, the social unrest um, across the country. Um, we we had, had had all of these, these incidents. And she said, isn't there something we can do to try to preempt this, to try to change the narrative? And, uh, and, and I got, you know, I just got thinking about it. I couldn't sleep that night. Um, I talked to a few friends of mine and said, I had this crazy idea, um, this crazy idea. What if uh, my opponent and I actually did an ad together where we talked about how we need to be willing to accept the election no matter what happens, the, the results of that election. There, there had been some articles about um, the, the president and some of his followers saying that, that you know, that, that, that it was already rigged, right? They were kind of setting the narrative to that, that we won't accept the election. So um, they said, well, you know, we need to get our people together and we'll talk to his people and see what will happen. I said, no, I'm just going to call him. And so I, we had, we'd had some debates together. In fact, our first debate or our first televised debate, it was our second debate, but our first televised debate was immediately before the first presidential debate. So ours ended and it went into that. And I don't know if I'm, I'm guessing some of you watched that. You may remember how crazy it was, just insane. And we, we kept getting all this feedback was, wow, your debate was so refreshing and so um, amazing and com especially compared to that. So it was a very low bar. So I just called him for the first time and I said, hey, I have this idea I want to float past you. What if we did an ad together and, and you'll have complete um, ability to veto any script. A, a friend of mine, we'd actually written some scripts uh, to share with him. And uh, we, we had talked to an ad agency who said they would donate and they were willing to help us out do it. They cared deeply about this. And, and he said, he said, well, I don't know. I, I probably need to talk to my staff. And I said, that's fine. Take all the time you need. And by the end of the call, he said, you know what? I don't need to talk to my staff. This is important. This is important for our nation. Um, let's do this. And two days later, we were in a studio recording. Um, a week later, we released it. And we knew it would get a little attention. We had no idea. Um, every major network um, we, we did, I, I mean, we did, uh, we, we did interviews overseas, uh, and it was important to us that we did everything together. We did 
every interview, the two of us together talking about, about these issues and how important it was. And I, and I think it just, it, it just shows you how hungry people are for something better and something different. Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, let's turn our attention to uh, what's on a lot of people's minds, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, Utah was praised uh, initially for its response. It's like many places had ups and downs since then. What do you think the state has done well and where do you think it can improve? What have you learned from your fellow governors and, uh, and how are you trying to deal with this at a state level? Wow, we, we've learned and unlearned so many lessons um, during this, this pandemic. Um, I, I think one of the things that we've done really well um, is uh, g getting kids back to school. Um, that's something the CDC came out last week um, talking about how important it was uh, to get kids back in school. And, and this, this has been a really difficult one. We, we only have one district that hasn't had in-person learning and, and they're going back shortly. Um, every other district in the state, all 40 plus of them, the rest of them have been, um, ha have been back in person. And we, we made this an area of emphasis and, uh, and really worked hard to try to keep people safe. Um, we, we were the first in, in the, the nation to implement what we call a, a, a test to play and a test to stay strategy. So we, we're testing all of our, our athletes um, uh, every week um, so that they can, they can play and we're, we're not having those super spreader events. Um, and then when, when we have an outbreak in a school of, of basically more than 15 students um, in, in a school that, that tests positive, um, then we, we, we go to all online learning for two weeks. Um, that's what we've been doing. We did that early, but then we got testing supplies so that we could, um, we could test. If we could test enough students, we could reopen those schools uh, sooner. And we, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've had our teachers um, prioritized first to get the vaccine. So we've been able to get, get our, our teachers vaccinated and, and really work hard to keep that open. Um, what, we've, what we've done poorly, um, I, I think is the same as, as many states. Um, and, 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 and to be honest, you know, it, it's been harder in, um, in, in some of the, the red states. Um, we, the, 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 the way we've politicized um, too many of these issues, especially mask wearing, um, that was a real struggle. Uh, we, we, we waited too long to implement a, a mask mandate. Um, we, we finally got there. Um, the, the good news for Utah is we're the youngest state in the nation. And so even though we've had, we've had fairly high case counts um, that have gone up and down like every other state, and that's the, that's the other thing that we've learned and unlearned is all of those things we thought worked um, probably didn't work as well as we thought maybe they, they would have uh, as we've seen, you know, blue states that were bad and then red states that were bad and then blue states that were bad. And we've all taken our turn at the top of that, that list. But um, for us, we, we still have um, one of the lowest mortality rates in the, in the nation. And, uh, and that's, that's good news. Um, and so we've, uh, I, I, I think the, the other thing that, that's really important is um, that while, while local control and state control is, is really critical, um, you, you've got to have uh, leadership at the federal level and, and you've got to have that coordination at the federal level. Um, we saw it with PPP, uh, or excuse me, PPE, those were the loans, PPE, the personal protective equipment early on um, when, when there wasn't uh, good leadership and coordination at the, at the federal level and it was every state for themselves and it was, it was kind of the hunger games as everyone was trying to get masks and, and gloves and testing supplies and we were sending planes to China and stuff was disappearing on the tarmac and we needed some swabs. Crazy story. Some guy was selling swabs out of the back of a truck in Chicago and we got the last load and we, we had to send a police escort to get, I, I mean, and then we paid 10 times what we would normally pay for it, but we were about to run out and our testing was so critical at that time. Th those were the insane things that happened and, uh, and, and, uh, we, we've certainly learned some, some of the wrong lessons from that. So you're, you're in your first, literally first month in, in office, although you were lieutenant governor, and we've got 
a new president who's only been there for now less than two weeks. But could you share with us a little about what the working relationship seems to be between the governors and the new administration and how that compared with the working relationship that you had with the previous administration? Has it stayed pretty much the same? And has it been sharply different? In, in what ways would you characterize the different approaches of the two administrations? Yeah, th this might come as a surprise to uh, many of you, but it, it's actually remained pretty constant. Um, as far as the, the interactions and uh, the, the, the communications, um, it, it, it really hasn't changed much at all. Um, I, I, now, something has changed, and I'll, I'll tell you what that is in, in just a second. But um, we just had uh, today, we had our, our weekly coordination call with the White House. Um, they've maintained basically the same schedule. Um, when it comes, uh, the, the Trump administration was doing that. They, the, the Trump administration did a very good job of that. Um, governors had an opportunity every week to engage directly um, on the pandemic specifically um, with uh, on those issues that were were really important and and work through. So we would we would you know we would have a call. Um, they would take turns. So you know Dr. Fauci would present and Dr. Burks and and some of the others would present and uh, talk about where we are in the pandemic, what the numbers look like, where supplies were, what was happening with vaccines, you know, wh when the vaccines would be coming, all of those things. That's, that hasn't changed really at all. Um, the, the Biden administration is doing the exact same schedule, same types of calls. If you had listened to one or the other, you wouldn't have been able to tell which one was a, was a, was a Trump call and which one was a Biden call, as, as long as the president themselves wasn't talking, then you could definitely tell the difference. Um, but, uh, but, but that communication has, has remained pretty stable. What has changed is we, we are getting a lot more um, detailed information into what's happening long term. That, that was really frustrating, especially with the vaccines that we would find out that week. And then a week later, things had changed and um, some of the information wasn't as good. What we're seeing now is they're telling us, hey, here's what's happening um, this week and three weeks into the future. This is what you can plan on. So you can start building that out and be ready for those vaccines. That type of communication is so, so critical and so helpful. It's been different. Um, I, I will tell you, um, I I've been disappointed outside outside of the, the pandemic communication. Um, we, we had a lot of executive orders, especially on the public land side that really impact states like Utah. And uh, there was zero communication on those, um, which, was, which was disappointing. I understand, you know, everybody makes campaign promises and executive orders are the easiest way to deliver on those campaign promises on day one. Um, but we, we had tried to reach out. We had um, had, um, in fact, I, I had requested a meeting and got a meeting with the, um, the transition team for the interior. And we were told, hey, we'll have conversations with the president and, and um, the, the vice president. And those never happened. Now we're we're hopeful they still will happen, um, but but uh, that's you know that's that's part of you win an election and, and you get to do stuff like that, I guess. Many Americans are unfamiliar with the fact that the federal government owns over half of the land west of the Mississippi River, and for states like Utah, where it's even more than fifty percent is owned by federal, close land, to seventy, yeah, about seventy percent. There's a lot of interaction that often takes place, hopefully, and needs to take place between state officials and federal officials as to how those lands are going to be treated. Um, well, let's turn to uh, another topic. You have described yourself, if I recall correctly, as a compassionate conservative and have been very interested in making progress on racial inequality and human rights in the state. Can you tell us a little more about the approach that you've taken to that topic and to what extent you think you found some success and where you think more effort is needed? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I, 
I, I don't know how I would describe myself. Um, I'm feeling more and more like a unicorn uh, person um, with, without a without a country, maybe not without a country, but but without a party. Um, certainly, uh, conservatism has um, has come to mean different things, um, especially over over the past four years. But um, the, the conservatism I believe in um, is is it really hearkening back to, uh, uh, to, to to past generations. Um, the you know early on, very early on, the, the party of Lincoln, um, the, the the party of uh, of women's suffrage. Um, the, the, the party that, that cares deeply about people. And, uh, and, and sometimes we, we forget that. And, and so my, my, my real focus has been um, in, in trying to find ways that we can, uh, we can bridge gaps and bring people together. And, and, and I, I believe, again, that the conservative cause uh, properly understood is about empowering people. And, and so we, we've tried hard to do that. I, I, I believe, and I've spoken about this in my, my state of the state this, uh, this year, which was very short, by the way, a concise 15 minutes. And uh, I, I would encourage you um, to uh, to take a look at it because I think there's some things in there that you probably haven't heard um, from a, a Republican governor, um, but but um, packaged in a way that 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 conservatives and liberals can can agree on it. And we 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 had some pretty amazing feedback, but I'll, I'll give you just one example of that. Um, I focused um, on education equity as as a cornerstone of, of our campaign and, and of our, our governorship. I, I believe that so many of the problems that we've seen in, in our country over the past year and 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 and, and specifically um, with with uh, the, the the murder of George Floyd and uh, all, all everything that kind of came out of that. I, if you if you boil it down to to its core, I, I believe it's a lack of opportunity, and that lack of opportunity starts at education. Um, I, I shared in in my speech, um, you know, the the the. The, the, the saying, the proverb um, that we that everybody believes, the, the right and left all believe that we um, it's better to you know teach a man to fish than to give him a fish, right? That's not controversial at all. Um, and yet, what we do in in Utah and in in this country and so many places is um, kids in more affluent areas. We teach them how to fish and we we give them a, uh, a we give them a, a, a speedboat and uh, a, a graphite rod and and one of those fish finders. And they're really good at catching fish. It's amazing, right? It works. And, uh, and too often, uh, uh, kids in um, our, our communities of color and kids in rural Utah, where I'm from, by the way, I think we have a lot in common between those communities that we should focus on that can actually bring people together. But, but we, we give them a, a stick and a string, and we can't figure out why they don't catch as many fish. And, and, and so I, I, I believe that, that this is our, our opportunity, um, is really to make sure that, that kids in the state of Utah, in fact, our constitution guarantees a high quality education for every child, regardless of zip code. Um, and, and if you look at education, you look at social determinants of health, um, that, that you, I mean, your zip code should not determine uh, you, you know, how, how long you live. Um, it, it, it should not determine whether or not you get a high quality education and, and, and education is a great equalizer, um, but, but it, it can't do that if we don't, um, if, if we don't get an equal education. And so I, I believe that that's an area where we can do, we can do so much better and, and trying to get, you know, my party to focus more on, on people. Um, will um, will ultimately lead to better results, and and if I can, you know, if I can convince rural uh, America and uh, and urban America that that their challenges are very similar, and they are, by the way, um, again, starting with education, um, we we have an opportunity to to find some new allies and and change some things for the better. Great. Well, thanks very much for sharing uh, your ideas on that range of questions. Uh, we've had an audience that's been very patient and I want to give them an opportunity to pose uh, questions for you as well. And uh, I think James is gonna help me out in identifying uh, who we have got that is eager to uh, ask a question. And I think Pete Stein is uh, the first one who's got his hand raised. And so Pete, will turn to you. Pete, yes. Just, just for those that are in 
that want to ask Governor Cox a question, just go ahead and use the blue hand function and we'll call on you in the order in which you put your hand up. Back to you, Pete. Thanks, James. And uh, thank you, Governor, so much for, for sharing your insights today. Um, and I also want to uh, extend my appreciation on behalf of Jamie and Rashmi, who are somewhere on this call, um, the opportunity to participate in the Taubman Center's transition term with your administration last month. It was a super exciting and fun and uh, illuminating experience. One of the things that we really took away was the level of social trust and so social capital, specifically in Utah. Um, and how Utah really stands out among, among states in that regard, and how that's been so useful, among other things, in resilience during COVID-19. As governor, how do you think you can go about further strengthening social trust, and especially when the national political environment is so fraught, um, protecting it and, and maintaining it? So, a great question, Pete. And actually, this is one we 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 think about often and talk about. Um, we we have been unique in Utah for lots of reasons, and and uh, um, there there are many smarter people that can talk about why we lead the nation in up, upward mobility and and those types of things. But but you're right, social capital and social trust are are a big piece of that. And, and trust in general is, is something um, that that I've I've studied a lot. Um, and, and I want to maybe I'll share. Um, there's uh, th there's a there's a study that's done every year. Um, the um, Edelman Group I think does it. They, they've done it for the past 20 years. It's it's a global study on trust in institutions. And um, they, they study trust in government, trust in the media, trust in corporations, and uh, trust in nonprofits. Those are the four areas that they, they focus on. It won't surprise you to learn that trust is waning in institutions, in all four of those institutions um, across the globe, but especially here in the United States. And it, it especially won't surprise you to learn that, that government is at the bottom end of that, um, of that trust scale. But, but they did something a little different this year. They tried to get at the heart of what is trust, what, what makes up trust. And um, they, 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 they basically discovered this, again, this isn't a surprise, but, uh, but, but they discovered trust is made up of, of two things. Um, the, the first one is competence. Um, we, we all have people in our lives that we, um, that we probably care about, but they're incompetent and we wouldn't trust them with our car or our kids, right? Um, so that's the first part of it. The second part of it, so it's competence and then it's ethical behavior. And it's, conversely, we probably know people in our lives that are incredibly competent, they're brilliant, but they don't cut their corner square. You know, they, they may not, not tell the truth, they cheat, steal, um, and, and we wouldn't trust them either. And so when I think about that with government, this is where, this is the, the only way I know that we can overcome um, the, the, the misinformation um, that, that is out there, can overcome the, the distrust, the discord that is out there. And that is by being um, incredibly competent. We, we have to be really good at what we do and, and government has struggled with that. And so I have, to, I have to hire the best people and hold them to a very high standard, but then we have to act ethically in everything that we do. That means we have to be transparent. We have to get rid of self-dealing. Um, we can't favor one group over another. Um, we, we, can't, uh, we, we, can't, we can't lie. <laughs> and that's, you know, we used to have this shared set of facts um, and we, we don't have that anymore. I, in fact, I encourage everyone. There's a great book. I, I know he's a Republican, but but everyone should read Senator Sass's book. It's called Them, um, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal. And, and he's hard on conservatives. Um, it, it's worth it. But he talks about this unmooring that's happened, this lack of shared facts that we have. And it makes it too easy for, for politicians to prey upon us, um, to, uh, to, to use discord um, and, and divisiveness to, to, to gain favor. Um, and and we, we, we just have to elect people who won't do that. And, and we have to, we're going to try really hard in Utah to, to set the example for the rest of the country and, and try to do better. But I, I got to tell you, um, it's, it's tough. Um, it's really tough. Rational people uh, that I know that are really smart and believe some stuff that's just out there right now. Uh, Matthew, thank you very much. Matthew Flaherty. Thanks, Governor Cox, for taking this time with us. Uh, you mentioned feeling like a unicorn these days, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on the future of the Republican Party and how it can return to conservatism after this affair with Trumpism. 
Uh, Matt, thank you. I, I um, th this is something I'm I'm still kind of grappling with my myself. You, you know, I I, I never. I, I try never to overreact to any situation. Pendulums swing, and, and they always have, right? Um, we, we've we've seen rough times in our country. We've seen rough times in 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 parties. <clears throat> we've uh, we've assumed that something means something, and it turns out that it, that it didn't mean uh, maybe what we we thought it was. Uh, but but I, I think what's what what's going to have to happen here is we're going to have to have a, a lot of people who are willing to. Um, to, 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 again, to tell the truth, um, to, to stand up for what they know is right at, to, at, at detriment to themselves, right? We, we have to bring in people who are, are willing to lose. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's a hard concept, I, I think, um, for, for people who, who want to run for office or who are in office now, um, who, who are, are willing to take chances and, and, and willing to lose. But, but I hope that there will be enough of us that we can offer a, a better path, that we can show that there is, is a better way. Um, I, I will say that, you know, I, as far as just the, the winning elections goes, um, the, the Republican Party did a lot better than I thought we were going to do. Um, and, you know, the, the Georgia elections at the end, uh, notwithstanding, um, it, it wasn't quite the, uh, the, the bloodbath that many of us were, were anticipating. Um, it, you know, so, so I, and I, I think there's a, a very good possibility. We, we've already seen it when, when, when parties are in power, um, that's when they tend to fight amongst themselves and implode a little bit. And, uh, I think we'll start to see that, um, more on the left. We've already seen a, a little bit of that, um, over the past couple weeks, right? It, it's kind of natural. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Republicans were able to, uh, to, to win back the house and, um, uh, and, and maybe even the Senate over the, the, the next four years. Uh, but, but that being said, it's interesting because if four years ago or five years ago, I guess, if we were having this conversation, we, we were talking about kind of the, the civil war brewing in the Republican party between the, the, the Ted Cruz wing of the party and the Marco Rubio wing of the party. Um, we didn't even know there was this Trump wing of the party, right, that, that came in and, and blew that up. So we, we never actually reconciled that issue. And now we have a, have a new one between kind of the, uh, you know, the, the Trump wing and, and everybody else, whatever, whatever that is. And so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by um, the things that uh, Mitch McConnell is saying um, and, and, you know, his willingness to call out some things that, that would have been, everybody thought would have just been normal to call out again five years ago, um, but haven't been. And, and it's going to take that type of, uh, of leadership, I think, to, to get things back on the rails. And, and, and yeah, I don't know, maybe, maybe it will take Trump starting his own party. Um, and, you know, a, a, a true reckoning and a, a, a third party. I, I, I believe that most of the country is, um, is, is fiscally conservative and, and socially moderate. And both parties have a piece of that. And nobody's figured out how to really bring that, that piece together. And uh, so it, it will be interesting to see if anybody actually capitalizes on that at some point. Right. Uh, Monty McMurchie. You need to make sure you unmute yourself. Hello, I'm going to get my... Can you hear me? We can hear you, Monty. We can yeah. hear you. I'm trying to get my camera on as well, but uh, technology is whatever. But nonetheless, uh, first of all, let me commend you on your presentation and your ethos and how you present. I'm a Canadian calling from Toronto, a Kennedy School alum. And I spend most of my time in post-conflict regions trying to ameliorate the violence or what is going on. And my question or comment is that you are from a great nation with a great deal of talent and a great deal of human and social capital. What is wrong that is creating this corrosion? And Professor Porter, 
of the part author in, in the book, which is absolutely fundamental in terms of the, of the, of the, oh, I can't get my camera on, my apologies. I'm just standing in front of my bookshelf, lots of books. But the point being in terms of the political industrial complex, because in the United States, politics is business. Business is good, business is booming, and you make more once you leave. And that has to have an element in terms of what I call the civic individual in terms of why he or she goes for elected office and why not by chance and why not in terms of by lot, because I always suspect there are enough people that you could aggregate a leadership, whether in the upper house or the lower house of Congress, including the presidency, that would be capable, competent, without being arrogant and austere. And I want to say I thank you for your comments, sir. Well, th thank you, Monty, and and uh, it's great to hear from from our friends up north. Um, I I appreciate your uh, your kindness. So so you know th there there are lots of of, of very smart people, people that are, that are smarter than I, who have um, who have their their hypotheses about how we ended up here. Um, I, I really do believe that at the core of, of what's what's gotten us here is um, tr tribalism, but um, maybe maybe more at the heart is is loneliness. So um, again, I, I referenced um, the, the book by Senator Sass, but but he quotes some other people in there. In fact, there was some there there was some uh, here locally at at, uh, at Professor Porter's alma mater B, at BYU. They they did some studies around loneliness and discovered that um, we as Americans are lonelier than at any time in our history, at least as far back as those studies go. Um, there are potentially lots of reasons for that, but um, there, um, there was a, a professor in Florida who did a study and uh, he, he, um, he, he wrote about how there are three types of people in, um, in, in our country today and in, in our world today. Um, there are the mobile. And those, those are people like all of you who are very well educated, um, who, uh, who have the ability to take advantage of the modern economy, right? So you can go from city to city, country to country, taking, um, taking incredible opportunities and you will do very well. Um, but but what, you, what you often won't do is, um, is, is become connected to the community in, in which you live in very deep ways. Um, we also, the second group of people we have are the, the stuck. So these are people who have, uh, who do not have an education, who are, are not capable of, uh, not able to take advantage of the modern economy. Um, this is where intergenerational poverty um, shows its face. They, they may move, right, from place to place or from home to home. Um, think, this, this is kind of the, the hillbilly elegy, right? Um, the, the, these are people who, who are, are really struggling, uh, people in rural America, people in, uh, in, in the, the, the Rust Belt um, that, that, are, that are struggling. And, and they may live where they live, but they don't have social capital. They're stuck, right? And then he said there's this third group of people, and, and he refers to them as the rooted. And these are people who, who are, are, are highly educated and have social capital, but have made a conscious decision to put down roots, to stay where they are, and to build up and share their capital with the community around them. Unfortunately, that is the, the smallest group, and it, it's the group that is declining in, in size. And, and, and because of that, um, what, what we're lacking is he talks about that, that Friday evening in the gym feeling. Um, uh, Roger will remember this. Uh, you know, some of us who are older will remember this. Uh, you know, in high school, um, it was the, the game every year where the, the whole town showed up, the, the, the whole community, regardless of whether you had a kid playing in that game and you were playing your crosstown rivals. And, and we, it, rich or poor, white or black, it didn't matter. Everybody was there and we were connected. And we had these organizations that connected us. Oftentimes they were churches, but not just churches, service oriented uh, organizations like the, the Rotary Club or the, the Lions Club or the Elks Lodge. These institutions that, that brought us together, again, regardless of our social status, 
Um, and, and we lived, uh, now it wasn't perfect for sure, but, but that, that is missing as we become a more mobile society and as the economy has changed and, and social media and all of these things have changed. And, and we're in this place now where we're lonelier than ever before. And we don't have, we don't have these close ties to, to people or, or to our communities. And so we're, we're desperate for belonging. And it turns out that one way to do that is if we don't have any friends, at least we can hate the same people together on Facebook. And, 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 and so we're, we're looking for those tribes and politics is replacing that and that's dangerous. We, you know, we used to be a, a religious people engaged in politics and now politics has become our religion. And that leads, if, that leads to, to trouble. And so that, that's, I, I believe that, uh, um, I think it, that's, that's something at its core. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we have to support and build up institutions and, and share some of our capital with those around us if we want to, we want to fix this. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes to Kent Shi. Um, thank you, Governor, for being here with us today and your dedication to civility. I want to ask you about Utah's plan to help out small businesses, you know, mom and shop, uh, mom and pop shops struggling in the pandemic and how it might differ from that of other states. Yeah, I think you'll see a, an approach that is 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 similar. Um, we're we're fortunate um, again with with the latest stimulus package that was passed. Um, the, those uh, those those loans are are really important to helping us keep doors open. Now, I will say Utah's economy has weathered this better than most. Um, we are 3.6% unemployment. Um, we, we actually had um, positive growth this last month. We're one of just a couple states that um, can, can say that. Um, we're also the fastest growing state in the nation over the past 10 years. And so uh, our, our budget, we have record surpluses right now in our state budget. So now, but there are segments of the economy that are still deeply struggling. Uh, and the hospitality industry, restaurant industry, arts and entertainment industry, some tourism, some of our tourism is doing really well, um, some, some is struggling. And, and so we're, we're trying this time around, what we're trying to do is to be much more concise and much more targeted. So we've proposed, we're in legislative session now, we have proposed state funds targeted directly at those industries and specifically at the small Small, um, the, the small mom and pop shops that, that are struggling the most. And, and our hope is that we can augment um, that, that federal funding that's coming in, that we can get them just through these, you know, the vaccinations into early summer and, uh, and then get things back to normal. And so our, our fingers crossed, we're doing better than most, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, our, our time has flown, but we do have an opportunity for one last question, and I'm going to let James uh, Moore uh, ask that question. Professor Porter, and thanks again, Governor Cox, for being with us. It's been a great to be with you and such wonderful message you shared with us today. My question is about, um, in the Wall Street Journal, there was a recent article that said that Utah has kind of become America's economic star, and you've been at the state level for so long now and participated in a lot of that growth. I was just curious, what's your take on what's Utah's secret sauce? Why are they doing so well economically in the past and continue to do so now? Thanks, James. I, I get asked this question often and uh, I, I should probably think of a more profound answer. Um, but but I, I think it's a, it's a combination of things. Um, and my, my, my actual answer might surprise you a little bit. So we, we have been, um, we, we've, we've been the, named the best state in the nation for business for Forbes, like six out of the last nine years or something like that. And, and always number one or, or two or, or three at the worst when it comes to, uh, to, to e economic growth. Um, so, so I think there's a couple things that are going on. One, um, we're a very entrepreneurial state. Um, we, um, we, we believe in, you know, people, People love to take chances and, and believe in themselves, but, but also have a lot of community support. Um, we, we have, I think, a great mix from a, a regulatory perspective of, of not being too heavy handed. Um, you know, we don't have the lowest taxes in the nation, but we, we have really smart tax policy. And, and, and again, but, but there's any state that could, could answer those questions. Here's why I think um, we're different. And, uh, and why I think we've been so successful. And it actually has nothing to do with business. Um, I think what makes Utah successful is generosity and collaboration. 
Um, we lead the nation in charitable giving every year, and we lead the nation in volunteerism every year. Um, and that ethos and that that kind of um, atmosphere and culture uh, is is critical to community building. It's 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 why I believe we we lead the nation in upward mobility. It's it's this belief that we all have a duty to leave our our, our state, our, our town better than we found it. It's, it's this idea that we, the bottom line matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. Um, that we, we care about our employees, that we, um, that we care about the, 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 the T-ball team or the kid that, that wants to raise money to, to take a trip back to Washington, D.C. Um, it's, it's, it's all of those things. And, and the, 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 um, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has said that, that the secret sauce in Utah is collaboration. And I, again, I think that that idea of giving back and, and lifting others has, has led to, to broader collaboration, um, not caring who gets the credit. Um, it, it's really interesting. We're, we're a super majority Republican state, but Democrats pass more laws um, with Republican support than, than just about any other state in the country. Uh, for for uh, their proportional representation, um, we really do work together to try to find solutions. We passed many laws that that you wouldn't expect from a red state that had support from from uh, from both sides, and and that bleeds over into everything we do. And, and by the way, it I'll finish here. It says government was not designed to solve all of our problems. Um, I don't mean that as a partisan statement. I, I, I mean that as a very practical statement. It just it just wasn't. It's a, it's 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 clunky. Um, you know, it's like I, I have a board of directors of 104 people. Uh, you know, they're all legislators and they all think they should be the governor. And it takes I in business I had a good idea and I could implement that good idea that day. I have a good idea now, and if I'm lucky, three years from now, some bastardized version of my idea will maybe make it through. It, government wasn't designed to solve all of our problems, and yet we're we're relying on it to do that because all of these other institutions are failing but they're not failing in Utah um, and, and business we count on businesses to solve a lot of these problems our business leaders are very involved they're very generous they're helping to solve homelessness they're, they're not just relying on us to do it they're coming up with ideas to fix these things um, the, the the nonprofit sector the faith-based sector they're all working together collaborating to solve the biggest problems and uh, and I think that leads to awesome stuff on the other end so well uh, this has been an absolutely delightful evening uh, one filled with more optimism than many uh, forum addresses. And I think the reason for that is what we've heard from Governor Cox is the way in which John Kennedy once defined himself as an idealist without illusions. And um, we need idealism in our lives, but we also need a dose, a heavy dose of reality and to not labor under illusions, but to figure out how we can work together. You're in your first month in office as governor. We hope that there will be an opportunity for you to revisit uh, the Kennedy School Forum in person one day uh, when the pandemic has faded and we can get together we wish you the very best in the big ch challenge that you have ahead of you. And we thank you enormously for enlightening us and giving us some basis for real optimism in the future. Thanks to all of you who have joined us tonight. Um, we will have a broadcast of this so that you can share with your friends and they can watch it as well. Take care of yourselves. Have a good evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you in another forum event. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Great.